Hello. All of us are, of course, familiar with the use of numbers in the book of Revelation. And of course, the first numbers that come to mind tend to be the groupings in seven, which are ubiquitous everywhere in the book. And then, of course, this peculiar number 666, which occurs just once in chapter 13. Now, the fact that 666 is so speculated about among Christians as well as non-Christians blinds us to its biblical significance, perhaps, because in the Bible itself, apart from all applications to different political or military rulers that have been around over the centuries, the biblical significance of it, of course, is that in Genesis chapter 1, man is created on the sixth day. So that gives an anthropological significance to the number having to do with man six, man's number, which is what Revelation explicitly says. And then, of course, there's another number that may be less, uh, less familiar reference in the Bible from 1 Kings 10 verse 14, where it tells us that in Solomon's day, the amount of money coming to Solomon from his international connections amounted to 666 gold talents per year. Hmm. So Bible students for a long time have identified the significance of 666 in Revelation 13 with perhaps both of those factors, Genesis 1 and this amount of money coming to Solomon as epitomizing as it were both the anthropological side of man's number six and also the economic significance of it. Because of course in Revelation the number of the beast represents both his military and political power as well as his economic clout. So we can't be sure as to what the early church thought of this, but it would be more than likely that those two thoughts would come to mind immediately. So in the book of Revelation, as in the book of Kings, uh, 666 would represent about the limit of man's power. What, what power on an earthly level what power on an economic level could be. And of course, because it's three times six, that is six, 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 it would be power, the power of man ramped up to the third degree. Seven, of course, in the book of Revelation represents earthly perfection or fullness, so that all of the groups of seven in the book are God's final judgments, oftentimes God's final judgments upon the system that man lives by. And also, of course, a reference to the seven days of creation, the perfection of creation, represented, of course, by the seven churches in Revelation as well. So seven has a kind of an automatic connotation to us because of its frequency of use in the Bible. But there is a uh, another significance to seven that we might forget, again going back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, because the seventh day is God's day, not our day. It's God's day, which he invites us to share, however. His day of rest is shared by us, by invitation. And therefore the Sabbath, the Sabbath is the end of man. That is in the sense of the goal of man is to enter into God's Sabbath. This is one of the explicit teachings of the book of Hebrews. But there is another day in the New Testament, the Lord's Day, which is beyond seven. It's the day one of the new week, what we call Sunday. But it's also the eighth day, the day beyond earthly perfection, the day beyond the Sabbath. One thing that is less familiar to us, and most of us don't think about, is the significance of the number eight in the New Testament. Well, obviously the Lord's Day, that particular use of it would be one of the things they would think of thinking of the number eight, but also the fact that the name Jesus in Greek, the name for Jesus himself, has the value in Greek of 888. So when they hear the number of the beast, 666, this is something they would think of that we wouldn't think of automatically. Uh, because in the ancient languages, specifically the biblical languages of Hebrew, Greek, and later Latin, all of those languages had this peculiar characteristic of having all of the letters having numeric values as well. Of course, this is not true of our modern languages. So, in this book, 
a small book by Bruce Metzger called Breaking the Code. Metzger takes on the significance of the number 666 in its original context of the, at the end of the first century. You may have heard the name Bruce Metzger. He is a scholar most familiar to those who have thought about the textual transmission of the New Testament. There's no more famous name actually than Metzger when it comes to dealing with the ways in which the Bible has been distributed across the world and the ways in which modern translations have used the textual traditions or history of uh, the last 2,000 years to benefit modern readers. Metzger taught for many years at Princeton Theological Seminary and in his book he says this about the significance of 666 in Revelation in the historical context of the first century. Who is this satanic beast symbolized by the number 666? Over the centuries a very great deal of ingenuity has been expended in attempting to answer this question. A further complication arises from the fact that some ancient manuscripts of the book of Revelation give the number as 616 instead of 666. Among the names and titles that have been proposed to solve the cryptogram, the most probable candidate is the Emperor Nero. If we add the numerical values of the Hebrew spelling of the name Neron Caesar, we obtain 666. On the other hand, since his name can equally well be spelled without the last N, if we omit the final N, the total will be 616616. There does not appear to be any other name or a name with a title that satisfies, satisfies both 666 and 616. Now that you can get from a lot of Bible commentaries and you can get from a lot of uh, special study Bibles in the footnotes. But here's his take on the theological significance of the number and the imagery of Revelation 13. The profound religious insight that lies behind these kaleidoscopic pictures in chapter 13 is that men and women are so constituted as to worship some absolute power. And if they do not worship the true and real power behind the universe, they will construct a god for themselves and give allegiance to that. In the last analysis, it is always a choice between the power that operates through inflicting suffering, that is the power of the beast, and the power that operates through accepting suffering, namely the power of the Lamb. Yes, that seems to me to be the, the way to reconcile the two principal images that pop through in Revelation 4 and 5 of John hearing that the one, the only one who can hope, open the seals of the future is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Then himself seeing, not hearing, but seeing a lamb as though slaughtered. That seems to be the way, the paradox of Revelation in explaining why it is that only, ultimately, one power will win the battle for the universe, and that power is not the power of Nero Caesar, not the power of the beast, but the land's power exhibited in the, sh the sword that comes forth from his mouth in Revelation 19. So we, do we have the faith that 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 power, the power of the Lamb, will be the ultimate power that will win the battle for the universe. Bruce Metzger, Breaking the Code.